is not age appropriate. This is that the person I'm running against is the perpetrator of that bill. He requested it. I'm talking to Maya Espinoza. She's candidate for OSPI. Maya, I want you to just talk a little bit. What does that stand for? What is it? And what do they do? Well, thank you, Beva, for having me on. Um, so OSPI stands for the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, an office most people have never heard of before, but it is a statewide elected office. It is actually the only statewide elected position that is nonpartisan, technically. I mean, behind the letter on the ballot is nothing. Um, and so the superintendent's office is what appears on the ballot. It says superintendent of public instruction. And this person manages the office of the superintendent of public instruction, which is a 450 person agency of education administrators overseeing our public school system. And of course, what they do there, the guidance that they put out has an influence and an impact on private schools. Um, and to a degree, there's a little bit of um, uh, homeschool families, I guess uh, I would say, pay attention to what goes on at the superintendent's office. So it is a largely um, administrative position without a ton of direct authority mandating you know, districts to do one thing or another, although, uh, I hope we'll get into some of the attempts at mandates um, later on in this conversation. This superintendent's office um, is elected in our state, but we're only one of 14 states that actually has this position elected. Most of the time, it's just a person the governor appoints in other states, but in our state, it's elected and it runs a 450 person agency. No wonder education so expensive in our state. <laughs> well, no kidding. And really, I mean, just looking at you, you seem so young to be in an administrative position <laughs> like that. Tell us a little bit about your qualifications and why you decided to run. Yeah, well, it's kind of an interesting story. So I am now 31 years old. This is my second uh, time running for any kind of office. Um, but most importantly, I think my biggest qualification is having kids in public schools right now that are failing. Um, I'm, I've been a teacher, been a kindergarten through eighth grade music teacher. So kind of the fun teacher, I think, but certainly a whirlwind seeing 100 kids in one day um, every week. And I, I got an appreciation for what teachers do. Um, but certainly, you know, teaching wasn't my full time gig. I'm actually a small business owner. I like to call myself like a mom entrepreneur because, of course, family comes first. But I have a, a few businesses I manage, including a nonprofit called the Center for Latino Leadership, which is an education-based organization that I've run for the last seven years now. Um, so education has kind of been this thread throughout my life that I never really paid all that much attention to, didn't realize how passionate I was about it until um, actually this controversial sex ed bill uh, was passed, 5395. I remember actually when the current superintendent um, authored it when he presented it to the legislature and testified in front of committee that, yeah, some people might be against it, but there's also people that think the world is flat and the Holocaust didn't exist. I mean, what a way to bring people together around an issue. Uh, so this mandatory sex ed curriculum that he had initially drafted um, of course, with the help of strong special interest groups like Planned Parenthood and the Teachers Union, um, this was a mandate and a request by the superintendent's office to make required by law teaching sex ed from kindergarten and not just any sex ed, quite an enhanced, advanced sex ed curriculum. You know, even as a young person myself, this stuff is not appropriate, despite what the law says about it needing to be age appropriate, this curriculum is absolutely not. I've got a fourth grader now, I've got a middle schooler, and looking at the material that would be approved under this state law is very uncomfortable, not age appropriate in my perspective. And so I had deep concerns about it. 
Um, when the bill was first presented, I actually called up our state party chair and said, hey, who do we have running against this guy? Because I'm really ticked off and I, you know, we better make sure we have someone good challenging him. And the answer was, no, we don't have anybody and we probably won't have anybody because it's a nonpartisan position. The teachers union always decides who's going to win. It's not worth it. Well, it was worth it to me. And so a year later, when this controversial sex ed bill passed, was when I said, you know what? Enough is enough. We've got to do something about this. We've got to get this guy out of office. If he thinks that this type of curriculum is the most important thing we ought to be doing in public education in our state, He's got another thing coming. So, you know, despite me not being, you know, particularly um, overqualified for this position, I said, somebody's got to do this. And I don't care, you know, if I'm not in the perfect position to do it. If nobody steps up, nobody challenges him and we let the ball roll by. So I, I have, you well, know, a I, little bit of background, but but certainly. I got to tell you, uh, the, the sex ed bill, it has been huge in our area. And of course, I focus on Spokane County. That's who we are, Republicans of Spokane County. And we're a big tent organization that includes all Republicans. I have heard from independents and from Democrats that this bill, in my opinion, is soft porn. It is yeah. way too much for children. I did get an opportunity to look at the curriculum. And frankly, I raised three wonderful children, very successful children with very successful marriages, and they have children. I don't want my grandchildren looking at this no. and saying, wow, that's normal, because that's up to the parents to, to teach and to answer questions as they come up from a child. Now, that's my opinion. You have two small children, or younger children, I will say. Um, R90 is coming up really quickly we have uh pretty much across even party lines we're pushing to repeal it can you talk about r90 and that effort and what do you know about the success of our ability to repeal that initiative yeah, well, it's actually pretty incredible that we were able to get this referendum on the ballot um, during a pandemic, during, you know, businesses for the most part being closed, during a ban on signature gathering. Uh, this organization, uh, well, really, it's not even a, an organization. These are grassroots parents and community right. members. There's no, you know, hidden agenda here of someone paying, you know, for signature gatherers. There wasn't a single paid signature gatherer. And yet we were able to collect as parents um, more than 266,000 signatures, um, which was set a record in Washington state. We Nobody had ever collected that many signatures for a referendum and it well qualified to be on the ballot. So what's confusing about this is the referendum is on the bill itself. And so the way that it's presented is almost like a double negative. If you want to repeal this mandatory sex ed, you vote to reject R90. And that is confusing for people because we want to repeal it. Yes, repeal, but approve means maintain the law, maintain the law that they pass. Reject means repeal it. We, the people, think the legislature overstepped. So if you are opposed to this sex ed curriculum, you want to vote to reject R90. And that's what I'll be doing. Uh, thank you so much for doing that. And I remember seeing on the news the the uh, signatures were phenomenal that came in on that just phenomenal good job miss espinoza good, good well, job it, yeah i mean i only gathered a few it was everybody you know signatures coming from all over it, it was just and, and you know what it actually came from an effort to put forth some of these outrageous curriculum in different districts this is what i'm told this is how this movement kind of started is that school districts locally were presented with some of these awful curriculum choices and parents went up in arms and they petitioned their school board to vote against it and so when the superintendent now my opponent chris reichdahl said no no you know you flat earth holocaust deniers can be quiet we're going to make a state law because we know what's best for your students those parents in all parts of the state 
rose up, joined together and joined forces, printing off petition signature gathering, you know, standing out in parking lots in the rain. It was incredible. But yeah, I played just a very small role. It just happened to be the thing for me, like so many, that was the last straw for this guy. Well, I'll tell you, you know, in this office that you're seeking uh, to fill, it has more, of course, than sex education. I strongly suspect that they will repeal. There's more to OSPI than that, though. Uh, The COVID-19 issue has been horrid for our students. What are your thoughts on reopening schools on the kids having been um, denied the social activities that they need and the interaction with their teachers. What are your opinions on reopening schools, getting kids back in there safely? We have to do it. It's completely unfair that we've allowed school districts to stay closed. When I talk to school board members, parents and communities, I talk to them about, you know, these parent surveys, a majority of parents want schools reopen. And that's not because they don't understand the risks of reopening schools. It's because they see that the benefit outweighs the risk. These kids have been away from their friends for six plus months. This is unacceptable. And again, this is an area where Chris Reichdahl, the guy I'm running against, thinks that he's done a fine job in paving the way for districts to reopen. The fact that they're not reopening is that they've made the wise choice to stay safe, safer than sorry. He's completely out of touch with with what is actually going on at the schools. I've got both of my kids doing online schools because they're in public school. The reason that schools are staying closed by and large is that they do not have the support to reopen from the insurance companies that are insuring the schools and the teachers, and they don't have the support more often than not from the local school union that are saying, don't open it up, we'll strike if you do. And unfortunately, that has left school districts, school board members voting to stay closed, even though 90% of parents want it reopened. So I wanna make sure if elected come January, if schools are still closed, I'm making sure that we're getting in there on the ground level with these school districts that have parents ready to reopen, the school district is ready to reopen, but there's something not allowing them to reopen, we need to get in there and make sure that they can because we know that private daycares are offer, are open. We know that private schools are open and operating. There's no pandemic there. So if the answer is more money, give me a break. <laughs> I like the way you think about that. And you did open up another topic of discussion there, which is the teachers unions. Oh, yeah. Uh, you are going to come up against some pretty tough opposition on this stuff. Are you ready for that? I was ready for it. You know, when I decided to jump into this, I knew, you know, they'd have my head and I'd be you know, <laughs> the the absolute, you know, adversary to them. I, I knew that to be the case. But that said, you know, in no way do I think that there's somehow that we, you know, some way that we get around them. They are the most powerful union in the state, for better or for worse. And so I do look forward to working with them on solutions. You know, maybe these local school districts are primed and ready to reopen. Um, They just need, you know, maybe some more massaging. I don't know. I'm trying to remain optimistic about the ability to work together with them. But I think the mistakes have been made both with the sex ed issue and keeping schools closed. Every single parent is really engaged in their kids' education where they haven't been before. And so now you put this in the laps of parents where normally we trust our teachers, we want them, yes, great, smaller class sizes sound good, yes, you deserve to get paid more. But now we're in a very different environment where essential workers are going to work, uh, Safeway and Starbucks workers are working and showing up every day, restaurants, you know, the list goes on, but teachers, have somehow, you know, advocated for their, um, you know, for them to be non-essential. And I think the teachers are essential and lots of teachers that I talk to see themselves as essential. Lots of teachers want to go back. So I think there is a way to do it. Um, But certainly I will not be, you know, the way that my opponent is, which is, you know, giving them everything that they want, leaving, you know, the, the, uh, the door wide open 
to the teachers union, we are going to have some expectations. I'm certainly coming from a different bargaining position. And I think that my background in, in running a business and of course, being from the uh, private and public sector will serve me well in doing that. Well, I think so too, but I also understand the, I don't mean to diminish a, a teacher's role in any way because, well, for one thing, I have a son that's a principal of a high school, so I wouldn't dare. This has put some tremendous burden on them. The, being, uh, I mean, he worked through the summer long hours trying to come up with a way to do online classes, and this is in a small rural area, so there are two issues there. One is um, the burden that the teachers have in coming up with, and especially in admin, of coming up with ways to produce equal learning, because if you produce uh, online services for one student, then you have to do it for all students, whether they are in special classes or special needs or whatever. So the unfunded mandates are killing the district, number one. But then two, um, in Eastern Washington, we have a number of really small school districts. Mm -hmm. Have you visited in any of those districts? Are you aware of them? Are you comfortable talking about them? Yeah, well, I know that the Stahican School District, for example, I think last time I checked, they had seven students. It, yes, we have some yeah. very small districts in Eastern Washington. Spokane, of course, is one of the larger ones. Um, but in Eastern Washington and really throughout anywhere that where they weren't using technology already, this was a heavy lift for school districts to up and implement um, an online learning platform. And, you know, who knew that they'd be doing it again in the spring because there was so, so much lack of direction and leadership. So I do put that on the superintendent's office. It's completely unfair to these small districts, especially. But what the real embarrassment is, is that we live in Washington state, kind of tech capital of the country, and we weren't able to successfully deploy an online learning system for the whole state. We have programs that work, we have curriculum already developed, we have um, whole online schools that have been developed, approved, and are fully operational in our state, and yet every single school district was left to fend for themselves, to figure it out from almost nothing. Right. That to me is entirely unacceptable. We should have provided a baseline, uh, here's something you can use tomorrow, but feel free to use something better if you find something that works better for your community. But leaving them, that is not the time to walk away and say, well, it's local control, because that's what we're having right now. Superintendent Reichdahl would like to mandate a, a sex ed curriculum because your district doesn't know best, but when you need help, he's throwing his hands in the air and saying, you got it. <laughs> I like the way you're talking about that. Are you in favor of keeping the small districts? Um, you know, some of those smaller districts live in very remote areas, and we would be busing children, very small children, long distances. Are you in favor of consolidating those districts, or would you like to see those districts remain uh, intact? I would definitely be interested in consolidating if those communities are open to that idea. And more often than not, it is a contentious issue. They've remained, you know, separate and small for, for a good reason, I'm sure. But I think it would be more efficient if we combined some of those smaller districts or somehow pooled resources in a more effective way. But I wouldn't know that until meeting with those district leaders, meeting with the principals and finding out what they want to do. The last thing I want to do is say, you know, I know what's best for you and here, uh, here I come to, <laughs> to fix it for you. Good answer. I raised my children in a school district of nine children. Wow. In school. Three of them were mine. <laughs> so I, I can literally say that I populated one third of the school district, small Adams County. I won't name the town, but a small little Adams County school. And the choice for us was to bus our children 60 miles, you know, 30 miles one way, 30 miles back. Wow. And for, for a very small child. Now, when they got up to sixth, seventh and eighth grade, boy, they wanted that. They wanted that uh, interaction freedom, with other kids, their age, et cetera. But, Boy, for kindergartners through maybe fifth grade, just not 
an uh, optimal way to, to do that. Well, Maya, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to throw at our people and, and uh, then tell us your website where they can reach you? Will do. Well, one thing that I want to make sure that people know, you know, the sex ed bill was very unpopular. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the person I'm running against is the perpetrator of that bill. He requested it. This is not, you know, something the legislature passed on their own. This is an agency request bill that he requested. So I think that's an important point to make and not one that many people know. They'll vote to reject R90, but I need to make sure that folks know that we need to get rid of Reichdahl too. Uh, and, and for a litany of reasons, not that one, you know, being the only one, but if you're showing up to the ballot for that issue, make sure your, your vote matches. I appreciate the time, Beva. I appreciate the conversation very much and the opportunity to speak with, with your guests. Um, my name again was Maya Espinoza. I'm the only woman running for this office, which makes it easy. Um, and I have a conservative background. So I hope that, you know, folks know that I am not only the conservative choice, the mom, you know, the teacher on the ballot, but the one that will maintain and uphold local control. So uh, I am inviting people to help me as we uh, reimagine education, and I mean that in, in the most you know literal sense. Let's look at it on a holistic scale, um, and and I invite people to do that through my website, which is mayaforus.com. M A I A F O R U S dot com. Um, there's a page that says you know share your ideas. We'd love to have you. And then of course I'm thankful to every single donation we've received. We have more than 700 individual donors, and at that uh, amount of donors, we've actually almost matched my opponent, who is 90% funded by special interest groups, including out of state special interest groups. So. I want to represent families and students in Washington State, and I thank everyone for their support in doing that. Thank you again for having me, Beva. You know what? Thanks for being on here and for being such a good sport. I know I've just talked your ear off here. So thanks, Maya. I'll let you know when this recording is available. It will be on YouTube. Uh, you can check us out on RSC dot, or Republicans of Spokane dot com. And the Facebook page will be on there as well. You can, it will be public. So you can actually look up RSC for Maya Espinoza and find the YouTube. So this interview will be available at that time too. Thanks a bunch, Maya. Appreciate your time. Thank you again. Have a good night. <laughs>